$2,000 and the MacBook Pro does not even have an OLED display. Never mind the $1,100 iPad Pro. Why? Because OLED is just hella problematic. It's expensive, leading edge supplies are limited, it allows for always on, but it's prone to burn in, smearing, and off axis color shifting. It also decays unevenly, and while it can be flexible and provides just the deepest, truest blacks, it also struggles with peak brightness, like hitting that subscribe button so we can all build the best community in tech together, brightness. So what do you do? I mean, besides hitting that button and cursing in the comments, if you're Apple, you power word kill old LCD. You just obliterate it from the premium lineup. Then you divide and conquer. You build up OLED on the smaller devices while hedging with mini LED on the bigger ones. Then, then you make them fight it out like Kaiju and Jaegers or just wait for micro LED to mature and extinction level event, both of them. And the way that's gonna work, well, I'm not gonna go all the way back to when Apple switched from CRT or cathode ray tubes to LCD, liquid crystal displays to begin with, not today, Satan, just to the original iPhone and its 3.5 inch LCD display. 3.5 inches, not because Apple cared about single-handed ease of use back then or anything like that, but because 3.5 inches was literally the biggest LCD display Apple could put into the iPhone back then. And of course, over time, they increased density, first with 2X Retina on the iPhone 4, then height with the four inch iPhone 5, then size in general with the 4.7 inch and 5.5 inch iPhone 6 and iPhone 6 Plus. But in all that time, 2007 to 2014, just over seven years, Apple never switched the iPhone from LCD to OLED, even though Samsung began going all in on it around 2009, even though the Apple Watch, Apple's own watch, was introduced with an OLED display in 2014. So why? Because OLED isn't really just OLED. Well, I mean, of course it is, but it's also so damn finicky that different suppliers have developed different ways to handle it, some based entirely on how much OLED they actually have to handle. Like electronics with OLED screens, ones that are typically held at arm's length like a phone, use entirely different processes than TV sets with OLED, things that are typically viewed from across a living room. LG OLED TVs, by way of example, emit all white light and then use filters to separate the colors. That's not only cheaper when you're dealing with comparatively huge TV size displays, but it also means no one color decays any faster than any other, something that's way more problematic on smaller OLED displays. But I'll get into that in just a pentile hot minute. For the Apple Watch, battery life was so limited and the screen size was so small that Apple felt they had no choice but to go with OLED and early specifically LG OLED in an RGB stripe, not the classic RGB stripe from LCD where each individual pixel is literally divided into a line of equal sized red, green, and blue subpixels, but more of a block with unequal sized and shaped red and green squares and a long thin blue line. All of this because OLED can indeed be way more power efficient than LCD because OLED, technically AMOLED these days, generates its own light. Active matrix organic light emitting diode. It's right there on the label. And LCD just does not. It needs a backlight, typically an LED or light emitting diode backlight, the non-organic kind. And yes, insert your species 8472 joke right here. But the backlight adds mass to the device. And also in standard LCD implementations, it's just all or nothing all on or all off, the whole entire thing, which is why it consumes a fairly consistent amount of power, but also why true blacks are almost impossible. The backlight, it just, it leaks worse than the iPhone supply chain. With OLED, since it generates its own light, off pixels are off and on pixels are on. Basically, it's every pixel for itself. And the less pixels that are on, the less power they draw. So with a mostly black interface like the Apple Watch, you mostly get a hell of a lot of power savings. And with RGB stripe, even if it causes some color aberration, like aliasing around high contrast edges, you're still getting a pixel density pretty much equivalent to LCD, which means it's still really sharp, really crisp, and really bright, even though that also makes it way more susceptible to burn in and color shifting. Because with OLED, the individual pixels light up, those pixels also burn out individually, decay actually. So if you leave something like a bright logo on the screen, for a ridiculous amount of time, the pixels showing that logo will decay faster than the ones that aren't. But Shyamalan style plot twist, the blue OLED subpixels also decay faster than the green and red, making those pixels not only dimmer, but 
eventually yellower. And because it's only those pixels, if you then switch to something else on the screen, that logo will still persist. In other words, you'll be haunted by the dimmer, yellower ghost of all those decayed pixels. On a watch screen, where you're not lighting it up anywhere nearly as much or as often as a phone or TV, it was a smart trade-off, especially with the kind of mitigations that I'll get into in a minute. For phones though, because sharpness and brightness weren't considered as critically important, but blue subpixel decay was kind of a deal breaker, they went with a diamond-shaped subpixel arrangement, what Samsung calls pentile. That puts a giant blue subpixel in the middle and surrounds it with two each of much smaller red and green subpixels. And yes, sure, you get a lower effective subpixel density and brightness, but that giant blue subpixel is just gonna last you. Plus the lower density made them cheaper to produce than RGB stripe at the same physical size, which became increasingly important as phones became increasingly large. But burn-in is only one of OLED's hot messes. There's also off-axis color shifting. Basically, the thickness of the OLED layer changes when you look at it from an angle, causing it to desaturate and take on a red or blue tint. Also, because of the response time or the time it takes an OLED pixel to go from full black to full white, moving bright text or graphics across a dark background could cause a smearing effect. And there was also, there used to be a graininess to lower density OLED as well, especially in the mid-tones, exasperated by no one else really seeming to care at all about color calibration or color management, at least back then. So OLED could look just hella garish, just crushing blacks and boosting sat like some first year Instagram cloud chaser. And Apple just didn't believe those trade-offs were worth it, not for the iPhone, not back then. Because if there are two things that dictate Apple's display moves, it's fussiness and scale. Fussiness because there was just no way that Apple was gonna slap OLED onto an iPhone until they could get panels that were high enough quality for their display team to start working with. And scale because there was also just no way to get enough quantity of that quality, not for hundreds of millions of iPhones, not for years yet. See, the way it works is Apple may contract Samsung's OLED process for their displays, like they'll contract TSMC's five nanometer process for their chipsets, but Apple doesn't do commodity anything, off the shelf anything. Everything is custom designed. An Apple display is every bit as exacting and annoying about how Samsung fabs their OLED panels as they are how TSMC fabs their chips. Maybe even more so because, for example, they may ask for completely different materials than Samsung is using for Galaxy panels on the same process. And then they'll take those panels and implement literally everything else about the display, including all their own mitigations, like machine learning processes that study how you're using your display so it can micromanage the exact position and brightness levels on a pixel by pixel basis to greatly reduce the chances of burn-in or how they implement their own filtering to effectively eliminate off-axis redshift, though not entirely blue shift yet, or calibrate each device separately, specifically at the factory and then completely color manage the entire system. And because OLED can be fabbed on plastic substrates, they can be flexible. So Apple used that to fold the display back on itself so they didn't have to stuff the drivers into the bottom of the phone, creating just a big bezel beard of a chin. Hell, they even built a dedicated OLED display engine right into their A-series chipsets to control the whole damn chain at the silicon level. And it was only at that point, that hyper-obsessive detailed point, that Apple decided OLED was mature enough for the iPhone. But even then, the supply of leading edge OLED was still so constrained and the price so high, Apple could only implement it in one iPhone, the first thousand dollar iPhone, the 2017 iPhone 10, at least at first. But time solves for technology. So by 2020, there was enough supply for Apple to go OLED across the whole entire iPhone 12 product line, though that and 5G still resulted in a price hike. And basically just rinse and repeat with 120 Hertz adaptive refresh. Earlier implementations forced people to manually select lower resolutions or abandon color management or lost high refresh rates at lower brightness levels. And Apple hated all of that. So they again waited until the quality they wanted was available at the quantity that they needed. Specifically in this case, the same LTPO OLED that they'd used for adaptive refresh on the Apple Watch is always on display. It just took until 2021 before they could get enough of it for even the iPhone 13 Pro to implement up to 120 Hertz promotion adaptive refresh, something that they'd done with IGZO 
IGZO LCD on the iPad Pro back in 2017, hilariously right when they were switching the iPhone to OLED to begin with. But that's just exactly why we don't have OLED on the iPads or MacBooks yet either, because on top of everything else, on top of mitigation mountain, OLED also has trouble with consistent brightness, with every pixel lighting up at the exact same level as every other pixel. And that's not a showstopper on watch or phone sized panels, but it can really stand out on bigger tablet and laptop sized panels, like the snow on Hoth looking just all shades of splotchy. Also peak brightness, because watching HDR on a phone sized display and battery is one thing, but producing HDR on a tablet or a laptop sized screen is a completely pro workflow another. And that's just something not LG, not Samsung, and not BOE who liberated a previous generation Samsung process years ago and has been working to catch up to and undercut the market with ever since. None of them have just been able to solve for that yet. Similar to what the Apple Watch uses, Samsung uses S-Stripe OLED for their tablets, but that's not something that scales in price or yield, especially not LTPO OLED, which Apple would need at iPad Pro or MacBook Pro size and quantity to maintain that 120 Hertz adaptive refresh functionality. Because if you try to take that away from pros at this point, they will cut you. And that's the whole entire reason Apple went another way for the 12.9 inch 2021 iPad Pro and the 14 and 16 inch MacBooks Pro mini LED. Mini LED is still like LCD in that it's true RGB stripe and requires an LED backlight. But instead of one giant backlight to rule them all, it has way, way smaller LEDs, like 10,000 of them and 2,500 local dimming zones, each of which can turn on and off independently. So light control isn't granular to the subpixel level like it is with OLED, but it's a jump to light speed beyond traditional all or nothing LED, and it can also get just super, super bright. But because of those local dimming zones, there can be a blooming or haloing effect where the bright areas still bleed out over the dark areas. And at least in Apple's implementation on the MacBook Pro, the same type of smearing as OLED may be worse because the black to white response times just can't keep up with the refresh rate. So you can see trailing on white text on a black background, for example. Now, there have been a bunch of reports about Apple switching mini LED out for OLED on the iPads and the MacBooks, at least maybe in a year or several from now, but it's tough to tell how much of that is real and how much is just LG and Samsung using their local industry rags to posture for business in public. But realistically, it's just a question of whether mini LED can get better to the point that Apple stops flirting with OLED for those larger size displays, or OLED can get to a high enough quality in sufficient quantity that Apple decides to just go all in and swap it in. For now though, Apple just seems super happy to leave them both fighting it out in the gladiatorial pits of Sakaar or something. And if I were a bust a bit betting man, my money would be on OLED coming back late in the third round to just Hulk smash mini LED all the way out of the lineup even despite it being so damn mitigation thirsty, but also that a new challenger will step up and enter the pixel Mortal Kombat ring, namely micro LED. And you can kind of sort of think of micro LED being to OLED what mini LED is to LCD. In other words, a fresher, newer, better looking younger sibling that basically just fixes almost all the problems with the OG. In micro LED's case, that means pixel level light emission like OLED but not organic like OLED, so it won't be plagued by burn-in or premature blue subpixel decay like OLED. But since it doesn't even need local dimming zones like mini LED, it also won't suffer from blooming like mini LED. And according to reports, Apple's had hundreds of display engineers working on micro LED for almost half a decade now, doing what they did with chipsets and maybe modems next. And that's just making way, way more of the process internal to Apple. And if past is at all prologue, they'll do with micro LED what they did with OLED. And that's start with the Apple Watch and then slowly expand, like literally expand to the iPhone. And then on from there as quality and quantity allows. And what'll be super exciting about this, if it works and doesn't just get air powered at some point along the way, is that Apple will finally own their whole entire display pipeline not just from engine to design, but fully from transistor to pixel, silicon to screen. And that's one of those highly differentiated experiences, one involving complete control of key core technologies 
that makes Apple so utterly Apple, like I hope the animations in this video have helped show. And if you've noticed me including way more animations in my videos lately, it's because I'm working on creating way more highly differentiated experiences myself, taking not just inspiration from Evan at Polymatter, but taking his actual class on today's sponsor, Skillshare. In it, he shows how to make an animated YouTube video. It's intended as an introduction, but like he says, by the end of the class, you could have your first video uploaded to YouTube because that's the true power of Skillshare. It's not just any one class. It's an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for anyone who loves learning. Whether you want to explore your creativity, invest in yourself and your personal growth, or just kick off 2022 with something new, from video to photography to illustration and design, business and freelancing, so, so much more, you can find a Skillshare class that'll match your goals, maybe even fuel your new side hustle or career. It's where I go anytime I want to learn anything because it's curated specifically for learning, meaning no ads, and there are always new premium classes available. So you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. And because you're watching this video, the first 1,000 of you who click on the link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare for free. Just click that button on the screen and start exploring your creativity today. Clicking on that button really helps out the channel. And so does checking out this playlist with everything that Apple has coming our way in 2022. So check it out and I'll see you in the next video.